and welcome to On The Ledge podcast. I'm your host, Jane Perone, and this is episode 266. In this week's show, I am going back to basics, telling you about the Chelsea Flower Show, and I answer a question about three plant killers. And in Meet the Listener, we hear from Angela. I've been going to the Chelsea Flower Show, gosh, I think the first year I went must have been 2009. So that's, gosh, how many years that is? 14 years, I guess. Uh, I remember going heavily pregnant with my son when I was literally (laughs) about to give birth. Uh, Fortunately, did not give birth in the showground. But safe to say, I've been going to the Chelsea Flower Show a long time. But it's occurred to me that a lot of the time when I'm talking about the Chelsea Flower Show on this podcast, I haven't really done a very good job in the past of explaining much about what this show is and what it's all about. Because I'm sure many of you Um, only have a peripheral understanding of what the Chelsea Flower Show is. So in this episode, I want to give you a bit of a potted guide, excuse the pun, to the Chelsea Flower Show, tell you a little bit about my thoughts about this year's show, and also reflect on where houseplants currently sit and where they should be in the future when it comes to the world's best known flower show. First up, a bit of history about the show. The Chelsea Flower Show happens in the very she-she neighbourhood of Chelsea in London. It's on the site of the Chelsea Hospital, more formally known as the Royal Hospital Chelsea, the home of the Chelsea pensioners who are veterans of the British Army, who are recognisable for their bright red coats that they wear. And every year it's held in the same place. It's been going for over a hundred years and is the best known flower show in the world and the flagship of the RHS shows. It's kind of unique as a a flower show in a way because unlike other flower shows where you go and the main purpose for a lot of people is buying plants, at the Chelsea Flower Show, shock horror, you can't really buy plants. You might find a few small plants for sale in the Great Pavilion, which is the massive tent where all the nurseries display their plants. But on the whole, the only time you can buy plants at the Chelsea Flower Show is right at the end of the last day, the Saturday, which is the sell off. And a bell goes an hour before the end of the show and everyone goes a little bit wild, sharpening their elbows to grab plants that are being sold off as displays start to be broken down. If you want to go to a British flower show and buy plants, pretty much any other flower show you can think of will have lots of plants for sale. If you like a bit a show that's a bit more spread out and you still want to go to a show in London that's iconic, I would suggest the Hampton Court Palace Flower Show, which is on in July. It's much more spread out. There's much more space. Even when it's super busy, you can walk away a little bit and find a nice spot under a tree where you can have a picnic uh, and you can buy endless amounts of plants. Plus, there are the classic show gardens and displays that you expect from Chelsea and uh, I would argue of a very very similar standard too. If you want to check out other RHS shows I'll put a link to the RHS website. There are lots of other shows run by other organisations and it's definitely worth having a look at those. Some of them are focused on selling and buying plants like the rare plant fairs, which happen across the UK throughout the warmer months. Again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you're interested in that. And it's also worth saying, subscribe to my newsletter, The Plant Ledger, for weekly drops of forthcoming houseplanty events into your inbox. You can subscribe to The Plant Ledger at janeperone.com forward slash ledger. That's L-E-D-G-E-R. But back to Chelsea. There are different categories of Chelsea, as I've kind of hinted at. You've got the show gardens. These are the flagship gardens that everybody wants to see that are the made by the top level designers. And there's usually anything from about 
I think about eight to 20 of these show gardens. I'm slightly guessing at the numbers there, but it does vary every year. I think this year there are 12. I think that I've seen as many as 15 in a year. And these gardens are where it's at in terms of the main focus of the show in many ways. This year, there were some really beautiful show gardens. The cost is huge a quarter of a million pounds is not unheard of by any means. And this year there were some really beautiful gardens on display. The winner of Best in Show and a gold medal winner also was designed by Harris Bug Studio, made up of designers Charlotte Harris and Hugo Bug. I have to express a little bit of bias here because I have done writing work for Harris Bug Studio before. So I'm probably a tiny bit biased, but I thought this garden was amazing. It was designed for the charity Horatio's Garden, which creates incredible therapeutic gardens in the grounds of spinal injuries units across the UK. And this was the eighth one. And the garden is going to go to a hospital in Sheffield after the show to create the eighth Horatio's Garden. But it's not just the large show gardens to look at. There are other smaller gardens on display. And over the years, there have been other categories uh, brought in for smaller gardens. There's been a balcony garden category, a container garden category, an artisan garden category, sanctuary gardens. It's changed over the years, but basically these are the slightly smaller gardens on display and showing off different aspects of horticulture. And most of these gardens are judged by a panel of RHS judges, and they can get anything from a gold medal down to a bronze medal, or indeed no medal at all. Now, I have to say from the outset that I haven't always agreed with the judging results of Chelsea. Sometimes a beautiful garden that I absolutely love doesn't do very well. Uh, I'm not an RHS judge, and I don't have a copy of the original brief for the garden, so... I'm just giving my own personal reaction and my own personal responses. And that's the wonderful thing about gardens. One garden can be an absolute dream for one person and leave someone else completely cold. And now we come to the houseplant studios. These have been introduced in the last few years to Chelsea. Not surprisingly, I guess, given the huge burst of interest in houseplants. That's not to say that houseplants haven't featured in the show before. Inside the huge tent that is the Great Pavilion, there are many nurseries displaying their wares. And this has included many houseplants, or what I would call houseplants. <laughs> um, and if you've listened to the show in previous years, you'll know this includes people like Dibley's Nursery, who specialise in begonia and gisneriads like streptocarpus, and also many great cactus nurseries like Ottershaw cacti, who you've heard on the show in previous years. But houseplants haven't really been displayed in the same way uh, as outdoor plants in terms of a designed garden. And that's where these houseplant studios come in. Each exhibitor gets a garden building. I think it's Malvern Garden Buildings who sponsor this category. So each exhibitor gets one of these wooden garden buildings to use any way they want to display plants. And these categories are being judged in the same way as all the others. It's been really interesting to see how this has actually manifested itself and the displays that have been put on. So obviously I've been really excited to see houseplants getting this extra profile, but I was a bit disappointed this year by the entries. Overall, I felt like there wasn't an evolution of design and I was hoping to see exhibitors taking something to the next level to really show off houseplants or bring us a story or tell us a story that really caught me on fire. And I'm afraid I didn't really find that to be the case this year. The best in show for the Houseplant Studios category went to Geb and Green with their Steam Clean Plant Repeat display. If you remember, you'll have heard Geb and Green in episode 254 of the this very podcast talking about their peat-free houseplants. So yeah, a great message. They won a gold medal and they also got the best in show out of the five houseplant studios. 
I love the message. If you know my podcast well, you know that I'm a huge fan of peat free. The idea was that the studio was set in a laundry room, but this also reflects the way that Geb and Green use a huge washing machine type structure to clean and then reuse their peat free substrates recycling it many times um, to use on houseplants. So I love the concept, but I found the execution not that inspiring. I'm not sure we've got past the idea of putting some plants in a wooden building in pots (laughs) at its very base. And so, yeah, I was a little bit disappointed. And as a fan of RuPaul's Drag Race, I found myself thinking of the episode of RuPaul's Drag Race UK Series 2, where Joe Black comes out wearing an outfit that RuPaul is very critical of. And I think Michelle Visage says, oh, um, you could have bought that in Primark. And then Joe Black sort of stage whispers, H&M. And then that prompts RuPaul into this huge rant about if you're going to buy H&M, you're going to have to glitter the beep out of it. And I want more. I want more basically is her catchphrase. And I kind of felt myself channeling a bit of RuPaul when I was thinking about my reaction to the houseplant studios this year. I want more. I felt like nothing really knocked my socks off. Nothing incredibly wowed me or made me think that uh, yeah, made me think about plants in a whole new way. Maybe it's just because, you know, I'm in a privileged position. I fully admit that. I go to Chelsea every single year. I see the same plants and ideas being repeated over and over again. I do see some new ideas, but for these houseplant studios, I didn't see anything that really challenged me. And I think that's what Chelsea is all about. It is about the absolute top level of horticulture, both in ideas and design. And I just didn't see much of that kind of absolute top flight horticulture going on in those houseplant studios this year. I'm wondering if one of the issues is the setting itself, the confines of a wooden structure. Is that stifling creativity when it comes to a houseplant display? I don't know. And I'm not saying I could do any better myself. I realise, you know, Chelsea is a really tough gig. It's incredibly tough. But I think if it's the absolute cream of the crop of horticultural excellence, then that's what we need to be seeing in the houseplant field as well. Funnily enough, my favourite of the houseplant studios was the one that won the lowest level of medal of the five uh, entries, which was a silver medal for the Botanical Boys and their Botanical Recharge houseplant studio. That just shows you my previous point is correct about not necessarily agreeing with the judges. And the Botanical Boys run workshops on things like terrariums and do interiors and they have a new store at Cold Drops Yard in King's Cross in London. So I really like what they did. And for me, this was the houseplant studio that came the closest to achieving what I want out of houseplants at Chelsea, which is something that doesn't just look like something that I could create in my home. I want something that takes things to the next level. And this display, for me, was the only one of the houseplant studios that came anywhere close to doing that. Let's find out more. Can you just tell me who you are first So, of all? my name is Tin and Hughes. Um, I am a sales rep- representative for the Botanical Boys here at Chelsea Flower Show. And I also built the sculptures that you can see outside our exhibit. Oh, very nice. So, this is all very stylish. Can you tell me, can you paint a picture for listeners of what we're actually seeing here? Of course. So, our business has two focuses. Uh, one is terrariums. Our business was started in teaching people how to build terrariums in our weekly workshops. But our co-owner, Ben, is from South Africa. And so he goes around the continent and he picks up all manner of art and and, uh, memorabilia and brings it back and we share it with people here in the UK. So what we're looking at here is our concept of a traveler's work desk where he uh, carries books uh, from Africa, uh, you know, memorabilia from his explorations, and also the plants that he's brought back safely in the Victorian-style terrariums that we bring here. 
Oh, that's, it's really nice in here. What I like about this is you haven't just shoved a load of plants in pots and put them on a shelf. And I'm particularly loving the Calanco at the back there, one of my favourite Calanco species. Yes. Um, I can't, I've forgotten the, this, this epithet now. Um, yep. I've, if is it, is it, uh, I'm just digging in to see if I can actually see. Yeah. Um, it's a felt bush. Felt bush the felt it, bush, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is a really beautiful, large specimen. And I love that pot too. Although I can yes. imagine repotting that's going to be a bit of a nightmare. But hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it'll be there for a while. Well, this is a gorgeous specimen for the Kalinko. It's an extremely healthy sample. Um, it's, it's doing extremely well. They're very, very sensitive plants. You know, too much damage to the leaves mm. uh, is, is a very common problem. But we've got a really healthy one here in the studio yeah. right now. And the pot that it's in uh, is Indostone. So these are hand-carved pots made from boulders from the side of a South African mountain. Oh, wow, okay. Essentially. They are extremely heavy. I can tell you as a, I bet. I can tell you as a six foot man, I cannot lift this on my own. <laughs> um, but they're extremely heavy, but they are incredibly well crafted because they are literally uh, hand carved out from a single piece of stone. Uh, and I also like the fact that everything in here is actually labelled. I mean, as somebody who, like, houseplant IDs are my bread and butter, mm -hmm. it's really annoying when plants don't have labels. So you've got these very stylish labels, but you actually know what everything is. That's important to me. I guess it's important to you too. It's, it's absolutely important. Uh, you know, we pride ourselves on our knowledge here at the Botanical Boys. Um, you know, we, we offer, you know, free plant care advice to anybody who comes by our stores in King's Cross. Um, and we have a lot of specialist plants, a lot of tropical plants. We tend not to do uh, typical sort of European plants. We, you know, we do a lot more house plants, which are a lot more tropical, a lot less knowledge about them here in the UK. And so it's really important for us to be able to share the knowledge and the uh, care and the information with our with our customers. You've got a little vessel here with something inside it. Is this some kind of substrate we've got here? Kind of. So these are our ingredients for what we use to make our terrariums with. So we have multiple layers in the terrariums. We have clay pellets in one pot. Uh, these form drainage at the bottom of the terrarium. And also clay keeps the water alkaline as opposed to acidic. Um, and then we've got a bowl full of charcoal here. So we put charcoal on top of the clay pellets. Uh, that keeps the water clean, filters out bacteria and fungus. And then we've got a special mix of our own substrate here. Uh, this is a mixture of worm castings, cocoa qua, lava stones, and sphagnum moss. Uh, this helps keep the soil, uh, the sub sorry, the substrate uh, relatively moist, but still with a little bit of drainage, uh, which is sort of ideal. You want that kind of balance in a terrarium. Um, but it also is not too nutritious either, because uh, too much nutrition in a terrarium can. Uh, cause all kinds of fungi and mold and things like that to grow. Uh, as a closed system, too much nutrition can, can just really damage them. That's a really good point, something I think often is overlooked. So yes. that's a really useful to have. And I think yeah, the these terrariums, what I love about them is a lot of them are really quite large. And I think yes. this is a, often a mistake. People think a small terrarium is going to be easier not always the case right? no. in, in my experience uh, smaller terrariums actually require more care uh, so the large terrarium we've got on the desk here is full of moss so moss acts as a really good water store pure water store inside the terrarium uh, so this big one on the desk probably won't need watering for another three to five years um, oh, well, okay. So, whereas a smaller one, which has less of the kind of the substrate and the and the moss in it, uh, that is going to filter through its water cycle a lot more quickly, and so you expect you'll probably expect to water that more like once to once or twice a year. Uh, so smaller terrariums actually require a little bit more care in general. So having the bigger ones uh, for those low maintenance people out there is really useful. Let's just go outside and have a look at these um, sculptures you were telling me about. Of course. Um, these are rather cool looking. Yes. Um, what is this made out of corten steel or something? Yes. So we've got a corten steel base um, and then we've got a mild steel uh, frame running up the side, um, which has all been uh, CNC bent. Then we've got uh, wood turned lids with lamps in them. And uh, each of the parts of the steel frame has a little mister inside. The idea of these sculptures is to replicate a terrarium in sort of a human scale. Uh, so we've got, uh, so uh, the misters are supposed to represent kind of the condensation and the sort of the water cycle that you would find inside of a terrarium. And then the lights on the top uh, represent just the small amount of light that a terrarium needs to survive. Um, and then we've got uh, plants that require the same kind of conditions as terrarium plants need. So those that like more moisture, more humidity uh, to kind of replicate the sort of plants that we would put in our terrariums in the store. Fantastic. Well, it looks really great. And what is 
good as far as I'm concerned about this display is it doesn't look like anything else I've seen in the Houseplant Studios yes. is unique so um, congratulations and I hope you enjoy the rest thank of the show thank you very much thank, thank you, you. Do check out the show notes at janeperone.com for pictures of the Botanical Boys Houseplant Studio. And I've put the details of all of the other houseplant studios in there for you to take a look at and you can make up your own mind. And I'd love to know your thoughts, whether you were at the show, watched it on TV or looked at it on social media. What did you think of the houseplant displays at Chelsea this year? The Q&A is coming up next, but it's now time for a soup son of housekeeping. This is a really boring one, but it is an important announcement. If you ordered a copy of my houseplant book, Legends of the Leaf, from Amazon and you selected the paperback option, then you need to do something because you're not going to get a copy of the paperback because there is no paperback edition. It's just a hardback as it stands. And as far as I know, there isn't going to be a paperback edition. The reason why this confusion has happened is because originally the book was planned to be a paperback and then a decision was made to change it to a paperback by the publisher. So when it originally went onto Amazon, there was a paperback and a hardback option listed. And so people brought the paperback. Not surprisingly, it's a little bit cheaper and some people prefer paperbacks. However, you will not have received anything in the mail because there is no paperback edition, as I've already said. I was kind of hoping that they would just send out the hardback edition to people who have ordered the paperback, but apparently not. I know this because I experimented in the interests of uh, you guys by buying a paperback just to see what would actually happen. And in the end, uh, I had to ask for a refund. It wasn't an automatic refund. I had to ask for one. And So if you've ordered the paperback from Amazon and from amazon.co.uk, you're going to need to message Amazon and ask from them for a refund. And then you can reorder the book either from Amazon or elsewhere. If you check out legendsoftheleafbook.com, I do have an extensive list of where you can buy the book around the world. And there are many other options other than Amazon. If you're in the UK, I do have a few signed copies, which I am prepared to sell direct. If you want one of those and want a particular dedication in that book, then drop me a line and I can sort that out for you. Uh, Limited supplies. So um, get in there as quick as you can on that one. But yes, I'm sorry about the disappointment and the annoyance of having to cancel your order, having pre-ordered. But there we go. It's outside my control. Amazon is a better moth and this is the way sometimes it goes. So yes, um, if you've got any questions about ordering the book, do let me know. Drop an email to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and I will try to help. Other than that, the book is going tremendously well. I've had an amazing response and some lovely reviews. Please do go and leave a review on Goodreads or Amazon or anywhere else you can leave a review if you can. I truly appreciate it. Also on the Patreon front, I have two new Patreon subscribers to big up this week. That's Erica and Michael, who became legends. And if you're teetering on the brink of becoming a patron, but something's holding you back, here's what you can do. I am offering free seven day trials for Patreon. So if you fancy dipping your toe into Patreon and seeing what it's all about, then you can do that free for seven days and then make a decision whether to continue with a paid subscription. So check out Patreon to find out more. It's patreon.com forward slash on the ledge to unlock extra content, more than 100 episodes of my bonus podcast and extra leaf the first 50 episodes ever of the show, ad-free editions of all the new podcasts, and of course, the much-loved December mail-out where you get a personal delivery from me. Now it's time for question of the week. And this one came in the form of an email from Christine entitled, My Three Plant Killers. I mean, that's about as serious as it gets, isn't it? And this message from Christine really is a cry for help that I think we can all relate to. Christine is in zone 5B. I'm not exactly sure where that puts her in the world, but probably somewhere in North America, I would suggest. 
Andy's growing everything from cilantro, that's coriander for us Brits, to spinach and goji berries. But here's the rub. Christine writes, everything gets killed by aphids, spider mites and these little white flies all the time. I'm only one person, but every single day I have to get up and manually remove the aphids from the leaves. I spray once a week with a miticide slash insecticide called Safer's End All. They just keep coming back though. Is this normal? Combating problems with nutrient balancing, bugs, disease, in addition to general caregiving, is a lot of work. And having put so much work into something and watching it slowly die is disheartening. And I don't want to give up, but sometimes I wonder if I will ever see anything become a sustained success. Please help me. I don't know who else to turn to. Well, you come to the right place, Christine, because I can offer you some advice here. Pests can be a real trial, as you have experienced. And it's totally normal for pests to just keep on keeping on, to keep on reproducing at such a rate that even if you spray and remove very regularly, they'll come back. Aphids have this incredible life cycle where babies are having babies. I'll link in the show notes to a picture of their life cycle, which just shows you how quickly they can reproduce. Plus, aphids can fly in from outside. They can come in on produce. They can come in on cut flowers. So it's a problem. Even if you get rid of every single tiny baby and adult on a plant, you might be reinfected from the outside very fast. Spider mites, similarly, are problematic. The little white flies, I suspect, are white fly. Again, similar story. They have these incredible life cycles. They're reproducing really fast, especially at this time of year. And the trouble with pests is that most of us hope and ask for a kind of a silver bullet solution to fix these problems Once and for all, we just don't want to keep on dealing with them. And I can totally understand your feelings about that. But unfortunately, there really isn't any silver bullet solution. I mean, it sounds like you're doing all the right things. You are regularly tackling this problem and you are removing the pests manually and also using an insecticide. Just make sure you follow the directions on the the insecticide to the letter It sounds as if you've got quite a lot of young plants at the moment and they tend to be the most vulnerable. You're also growing a lot of things that traditionally would be ideally grown outside. So things like coriander, lettuce, spinach and goji berries. Really, those are outdoor plants. It's fine to start them off in your house because you probably need to keep them that little bit warmer than your outside environment is currently offering right now in May in zone 5b however in the long term something like a goji berry is not going to hack it indoors the reason being the, the light levels are just not high enough goji bushes develop into a huge and i mean huge plant given the chance people hedge them because they are so unruly i have one in my garden it's produced hardly any berries i mean literally uh like (laughs) one tiny berry but it is rampant and I kind of regret planting it I need to think of it more of a a hedge than as a a shrub and I need to cut it back harder than I do if you've never come across goji berries the latin name is lyceum chinense and goji berries have been given lots of amazing health claims over the years and they're they're good berries they contain lots of antioxidants they are good for you But there are other things you could be growing uh, too. Interestingly, in China, the leaves of the goji berry are also eaten. So if you don't get any goji berry out of your plant, then you could always eat the leaves. As always with leaves, you want the young, tender growth, not the old, leathery ones. But what I'm trying to say with this talk of outdoor plants versus indoor plants is this is always going to be a struggle with the things you're trying to grow. If possible, you want to make those plants the strongest they can be because strong, healthy plants will be able to fight off pests most successfully. Young, weak plants are just very, very susceptible to this kind of damage. So if you can make sure they're getting maximum light, that will really help them to do well. And ultimately, all of these young plants, maybe with the exception of the coriander, 
you could probably grow that indoors if you and, and maybe some lettuce. But most of these things will be better off outside if you can get them outside. I know that your growing season, you say, is quite short in zone 5B. But once it does warm up, get those plants outside. They will romp away with the extra light and you'll find that you have less of a problem. And oftentimes plants will grow past pests like this when they do have the right conditions to grow in give you an example i have an elder tree in my garden it's the purple leaved variety i think it's called black beauty and it always gets black fly at this time of year those black aphids it's always covered in them but you know what it keeps growing and it's absolutely fine um, i sort of wash them off if i can but generally speaking i don't get round to it and birds and other and insects make a fairly good job of tackling them but the plant just grows past the problem because it's generally happy so that's what i'm sort of trying to hint at christine with your plants get them outside as soon as you can as soon as it's warm enough and it should improve your chances of, of success provided of course that you don't then find out that they're going to get munched by something like a slug or a snail <laughs> because of course our pest problems are multitudinous but I think it's a mindset issue generally with pests in the home we've got to be on alert at all times they will come back there's no magic solution other than chucking your plant away and getting a new one I've recently thrown in the towel with my Raphidophora testrosperma. It was covered in scale. It was causing scale on other plants. So I literally just cut it up and I've got wet sticks now, which are being treated for scale. And I'm going to start again because life is just too short to keep removing that scale. So you need to know when to throw in the towel, when to keep battling. And just remember, Christine, you are not alone. Everybody listening to this show, if they have more than one houseplant and have been growing for a while, will have experienced this story. So I hope that's given you some comfort to know a little bit more about your plant killers. The only other thing to say, and again, a common theme on this podcast if you can figure out exactly what you've got that does help so the little white flies are they definitely white fly uh, you know a hand lens i say it all the time but get that hand lens have a look check it is spider mites check it is white fly look up what these creatures look like identify them correctly and then it will help you to give the right treatment spider mites and aphids tend to locate themselves differently aphids will always be on fresh new growth so for example this week i discovered a load of aphids on my orchid cactus on the actual flowers they love the flower buds the great source of um sap presumably so i had to take that plant outside and spray it off flowers growth points those are the places that aphids will be found spider mites on the other hand the backs of leaves, what we call the abaxial part of the leaf, the underside part of the leaf. That is where spider mites love to dwell. And we're looking for kind of white grainy stuff that might be gathering there, which is the shed skins of the spider mites and also their eggs. But get your hand lens, get your eye in, have a look and you should be able to spot them easily. So that's the deal, Christine. I hope that is helpful in some way, shape or form and keeps your plants going a bit longer. And I wish you success with all the things you're trying to grow this year. And as always, if you've got a question for me, then drop me a line. And now back to the Chelsea Flower Show and... I want to take you inside the Great Pavilion. And this is often an underrated part of the show because inside this giant white tent are many fabulous nursery displays. But there's also floristry, if that happens to be your thing, and many educational exhibits and a few show gardens as well. There's the All About Plants show gardens inside the tent, including the Choose Love garden, which I particularly liked. And this garden was inspired by the migration routes that refugees take across Europe and contains some wonderful herbs and also a fabulous super adobe wall made from earth. So I'll put that in the show notes for you to take a look at. Uh, it was one of my favourites. 
But the thing I wanted to bring you audio from was a display investigating and celebrating the Florida ghost orchid. And this was a collaboration between various different people, including Grow Tropicals, the UK based plant seller who you've probably heard on on the ledge before via Jacob James of Grow Tropical, who talked to us about terrariums, a lot working with the Royal Botanic Gardens Q in the US, Fairchild Botanical Garden, Chicago and Naples Botanic Gardens, and also Glasgow Botanic Gardens. So the idea of this garden was taking a look at orchid conservation around the world using the Florida ghost orchid as an example and an exemplar. Now, you may be aware of this orchid because it has been featured in popular culture before. Um, There was the book The Orchid Thief and also the um, movie adaptation. The Latin name is Dendrophylax lindenii and it's a leafless epiphyte. So, epiphyte, it grows attached to other plants and yeah, it's got no leaves. It is able to use its roots to photosynthesize and the leaves are just basically scales. You can't see anything that you or I as would describe as a leaf. And as the name suggests, they grow in southern Florida in very hard to negotiate terrain. Here's Julianne McGuinness of the Smithsonian Institute's North American Orchid Conservation Centre, explaining why the Florida ghost orchid is the centrepiece of this display. The ghost orchid, the Florida ghost orchid, is sort of the poster child for orchid conservation in the U.S. because um, in many ways it's a success story. We've been able to extract the mycorrhizal fungi that it needs from the roots and, and really learn how to cultivate the ghost orchid so that it can be reintroduced into the wild because it has been under such um, pressure and such threats in um, its native habitat from everything from poaching um, to um, habitat loss and storms and and hurricanes and such. So um, so it really is... um, very special that it's been um, propagated in uh, several botanic gardens now and can now be introduced in some places where it was declining and that's very exciting and more is beginning to be understood about its uh, pollinators and its, you know its full habitat needs with the fungi and the pollinators and so on we seem to be struggling to, I mean, maybe we're not, maybe this is changing, but, you know, it's not an easy job going out into the field to research oh, no. this, right? No, no. <laughs> In fact, um, earlier, several of my colleagues here had their snake boots on. They had to battle alligators and poisonous snakes. <laughs> and as you can imagine from this um, little, this sort of, uh, our exhibit evokes the panther refuge in south florida or the corkscrew swamp or um, the fakahatchee strand many of the um, preserved areas where the ghost orchid and um, other types of florida orchids thrive so this very much looks like the type of terrain that they um, have to navigate to study the right. ghost orchid wow. in the wild And I wanted to find out more. There were plenty of people on the stand to chat to. And I managed to grab Joanna Hutchins of Chicago Botanic Garden and Tony Ruiz, who is a student at Illinois College, to find out a bit more about the fascinating story of the Florida ghost orchid. I was just saying, this is the kind of stand that I love at Chelsea. I'm learning something new. I'm seeing something I've never seen before. The Florida ghost orchid, it says on the thing, it's saying enigmatic. Why is this an enigmatic and fascinating plant that we need to know about? Who's going to start with that one? (laughs) That's a very hard question to say, but it's, I think it's due to its rarity and only being occurring in South Florida and also in Western Cuba. It's in such a like difficult area to get through the swamps, very hard to traverse through. It's like 90 degrees, hundred percent humidity. You're battling snakes Oh, waist high water, alligators, all just to look for this leafless epiphyte that's absolutely gorgeous. And I think that adds a lot to what it is as a plant. Because when a lot of people think of orchids, they think of like lush, bright flowers, a lot of green foliage. And since this is a leafless orchid, it just looks very different. And in most inst- instances, 
if it's not in flower mm -hmm. and you don't know what you're looking for, you're probably not yeah. going to you're not gonna find it. Yeah, so yeah. It's got that like uh, air of mystery around it. Right, right. And why is this orchid so rare? Is it is it habitat destruction? Is it poaching? What's what's why is this orchid not more uh, commonly around? Uh, it's definitely a combination of everything. They grow in very specific environments. Um, yeah, they, 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 like she said, it grows in incredibly specific environments, and then obviously climate change is having a huge impact on on its environments. Like in, like uh, more severe storms that always takes orchids off the trees. It's very detrimental to their populations. And, right. Poaching has been a, a significant issue. Uh, we have had researchers here that have encountered poachers multiple times. It's just a combination of basically everything that you see as regular factors that hurt orchids. Right, right. Uh, and is, is there sort of a... Uh, it sounds horrific, I'm not going to lie. I lived in Louisiana for two years, so I know about the heat, but I've not been wading, like, chest high in, like water and stuff to, that sounds quite a task is it is it one of those things where it's is proving hard to recruit people who want to go and study this or is there enough of a pull i mean you're you guys are all looking quite young you must there must be enough of interest here to get you doing this dangerous work um i i do believe there's quite a lot of work but not a lot of people actually get to go out into the right. field like we do we have a great relationship with um the florida panther national wildlife refuge with mark danaher he lets us come in the let me specifically come in for the past few few years adam herdman behind you he's gone multiple years before um specifically uh, naples orchid society donates money to us to be able to fund us to be able to do our research it is it's quite a task for Dr. Zettler, I think, to get um, students interested in, but he talks all about it and talks very nicely of it. He tells <laughs> us we'll be walking with alligators, wading with snakes, all that stuff, but he does a really good job of recruiting everyone in and everyone helps out to get us there. I think the passion of people who have worked with us for so long, like Dr. Zettler and Dr. Kane, um, it's really contagious. And I've seen how it's affected so many people that then have gone on to study it, a lot of them who are currently here. So it may be challenging environmental conditions, but the passion of people who really want to conserve this species and its environment, um, I think that kind of helps sell it and uh, speaks for itself. And what don't we know about the ghost orchid that you still need to find out? There's still, there must be loads more that you're just... Or only on the tip of finding out what you need to learn about this orchid? Um, there's been all kinds of research on it, but obviously there's always a lot more to do. Um, specifically, one of the other people here, Lennon Johnson, has worked on the mycorrhizal fungi that um, the ghost orchid uses to, prop, to germinate. Um, I specifically have studied the nectar of the ghost orchid to see its uh, chemical uh, composition, see what's in it, so what the pollinator would want. Um, Dr. Haley Ray, she um, works with... She, studies the fragrance of the ghost orchid and its pollinators to see why they like it and what they are coming for and all that good stuff. There's always new things being discovered about it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was sometime in the last five years that they finally got photographic evidence of the pollinator of the ghost orchid. Yeah. Um, so it had always been um, hypothesized what it was, but there was no um, actual proof until relatively recently. And what is the pollinator? <laughs> uh, the pollinator is the giant hawk moth or the sphinx moth. Oh, okay. It was hypothesized because it has such a long nectar spur, they needed a right. moth with a long proboscis to go into it. And so. that, sound, that sounds kind of basic, but that involves somebody sitting there for a long time yes, watching, waiting. There's, there's been many waiting, attempts. And, you know, and then also, is that <laughs> insect actually pollinating or is it just passing by like yeah. is it actually pollinating yeah. the, the plant there was one study that or so i think it got put in a, a famous magazine and it had a the hawk moth visiting it but it didn't have any pollen on its right. head but one of the people we knew actually got a picture of the the hawk moth with the pollen on its head so it yeah. basically proved that it was pollinated the ghost so these hawk. are the paired pollen sacs we're talking yes. about here yes. that um i'm i yeah, I, I know. I did some research into another plant, a Hoya species, and pollinator research. So that was kind of how I knew what you were talking about there, because yeah. it's really specific, isn't it? It's not just any old fly or bee that's going to come in with that shape of flower and the um, the structure. It's yes. really quite unique. 
Oh, yeah. that's amazing. I believe there were some that they had thought could be potential pollinators, but um, because of the anatomy of the moth, they wouldn't have actually come in contact with the pollinia, even though they had been seen right. um, visiting the flowers. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of work going And what are you expecting people to be... I mean, uh, obviously today's a bit strange because it's press day, but once you've got members of the public coming along, I imagine this is going to be fascinating, but some people are going to may be asking why why bother with a tiny little thing you can hardly see what what why do we need to know this stuff so the ghost orchid is um sort of like a canary in the coal mine and orchids in general are really good environmental indicators um so if the orchids go from an area you know that other things will soon follow suit and so that's why it's important to study the orchids and also to conserve them and protect their environments do check out the show notes for some good Florida ghost orchid links and more information if you want to find out anything about the Chelsea Flower Show. But now it's time for Meet the Listener. And this week we're meeting one of my Australian listeners. Hi Jane, I'm Ange and I'm joining you from Melbourne, Australia where today it is sunny but starting to be quite chilly as we head into winter. Though since many of your listeners probably live in some much colder places, I should maybe add that cold by Melbourne standards isn't really that cold. This is probably evidenced by the bird sound that you can hear in the background. When did you get into houseplants and why? I think I've always liked plants. Now, and while I over, don't really that, know why, I think it is said, in part that, all of that said, I just feel that plants, along with books, make a place feel RHS like home. Chelsea. It started and with a I parlor palm called Friend that I had when I was 10 or 11, when I first got my own bedroom. And then for the last 20 years or so, I've travelled a lot for work. And whenever I've been anywhere longer than a couple of weeks, it's been a plant, or sometimes several, that have made a place feel like home. Really What's the latest addition this to your houseplant collection? All about I've actually been orchids. working hard not to buy new plants for the last year or so, but I have been propagating a lot, so orchid. I guess it depends what you call addition. Uh, a few days ago, I moved a bunch of newly propagated plants into small pots, and that included an angel wing begonia, <laughs> a few different kinds of philodendron, including the mycans, which I really love because of its fuzzy leaves, and a chain of hearts. Complete the sentence, I love my houseplants because... I love my houseplants because they just make me happy. I like the problem-solving aspect of working out how to make each one thrive. I love the calming effect of plant time while I potter about, working out what each one needs. And, you know, they're just beautiful. Who is your houseplant hero? Well, it's, the other thing I have loved is learning about the... So women like uh, Marianne North, Olive Pink, and the Scott sisters, who were all amazing botanical artists, to botanists and horticulturalists like Gertrude Jekyll, Janaki Amal, and Fran Bodkin... The list just goes on and on, and every time you discover one amazing woman who's done amazing planty things, you find another five or ten or twenty to learn more about. Name your plantagonist, the plant you simply cannot get along with. My plantagonist, well, it's not original, but it's got to be the Calathea. It's just, oh, they're just too hard, and life is too short for me to bother with them. Oh, and for some reason, the watermelon peperomia, which other people seem to find really easy and all of them just die while under my care. Thank you, Ange. I love the fact that you led with a weather prediction. <laughs> Something that's always on my mind for sure. And I'd love to hear from anyone who is brave enough to put themselves forward for Meet the Listener. It's really easy to take part just drop a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and you might be hearing your voice on this podcast soon. That is all for this week's show. I'll be back in two weeks. Remember, this is now a show that comes out every other week. So two weeks from now, I'll be back with another episode. So 
enjoy your plants and keep you and them well hydrated. Bye! The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Kumiku, Chiefs by Jazar, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.